Because what we're going to see here, my friends, those uh, who vote yes on women's ordination, those who say yes, a woman should be installed as a local elder, installed as a local pastor, those who vote yes on women's ordination will also vote yes to persecute God's people. Amen. In Great Controversy, page 608 says, as a storm approaches, a large class who have once professed faith in the third angel's message, but have not been sanctified through obedience to God's truth, will abandon their position and join the rank of the opposition by conforming to the world and partaking of its spirit. They have come to view matters in nearly the same light. And when the test, when the test, when the mark of the beast is in force, they are prepared to choose the easy popular side. So those who vote yes on a woman's ordination when the mark of the beast is in force, great controversy, page 608 says, they will join with the world and uphold Sunday, renounce God's Sabbath. They will receive the mark of the beast. The same issues. The same issues that surrounded the fall of mankind in the Garden of Eden are happening when? Are happening now. The final fall of mankind is about to take place. On what issue? What was one of the issues that caused the fall of Adam and Eve? Eve first, trying to rise above your position, Eve, to fill the position that the man must fill. Do you see it, my friend? And that was one of the issues that brought the fall in the first place. So when we see now that issue has come to full circle in the last days now, church is saying now, we must ordain a woman to be an elder, a woman to be a pastor, to be the ruler in the home and in the church. Where are we now? We're in the last days. Friends, what does a woman represent in prophecy? Church, hold on there now. Friends, you must get this. Since a woman represents a church in prophecy, Satan was also saying to Eve and to us in these last days, the church's standards can be placed above the word of God. You're not hearing me. Huh. Man-made traditions, man-made culture can be placed above the word of God. You can do that and still be saved. And the issue of ordaining a woman as an elder, a woman as a pastor, it's unbiblical. So when we say, let's go ahead and do it, what are we doing? We're putting man-made traditions above the word of God. And that's just one of the many issues confronting Seventh-day Adventism. And since that was one of the issues that brought the fall of mankind in the Garden of Eden, and now we're seeing it now confronting the church, where are we? In the last days. It says the very beginning of the great apostasy was in seeking to supplement the authority of God by that of the church. Since there was a beginning of the great apostasy, there must be what? An ending of the great apostasy. How did the great apostasy begin? Huh? When the church began to supersede God's word by implementing upon its members man-made doctrines. You're not hearing me. So when now the Seventh-day Adventist denomination begin to use man-made traditions and culture on this point of ordaining, installing a woman as an elder, a woman as a pastor, it shows then that we are living in a time when the church is superseding God's word. This tells us we are not living in the beginning of the great apostasy. We are living at the end of the apostasy. Last days, my friends. And friends, pause there. 
which church, which denomination is known above every other denomination presently to supersede God's word with man-made tradition. Which church? Which church? Which church? Is the church that Pope Francis, the present Pope, belongs to. It's Roman Catholicism. And many of us uh, as Seventh-day Adventists uh, point and say, it's Rome that has used uh, man-made traditions to supersede God's murder and force uh, those man-made traditions upon its members. Yet the Seventh-day Adventist leaders uh, who should be God's remnant leaders are doing just like Popery. It shows then that we're drinking from the wine of Babylon. Don't walk away and say, well, pastor said the seventh day of his church is Babylon. Didn't say that. But we are drinking from the same wine cup. You have these ministers now. Pastor David Asherick, he says, I, listen, David Asherick said, I believe was on uh, a website. He said, clearly, he said, I don't see anywhere in the Bible where God's word say a woman should not be an elder or a pastor. Since I don't see where the Bible says a woman should not be an elder, well, I'm voting yes. David Asherick. Now, Pastor Carlton Bird, same, same sentiments. Dwight Nelson, same sentiments. Pastor Ricardo Graham, the Pacific Union president, same sentiments. And friends, I'm telling you, these are prominent men in God's church. Amen. But they have taken the wrong stance. And my prayer is, is that they will turn before it is too late. Amen. Because those who add to God's word, they will end up by doing what? Subtracting from God's word. And those who view matters in nearly the same light as the world will receive the mark of the beast. Go back to Great Controversy, page 608. These men and many others, many others, and don't think I'm picking on these or condemning these men. No, I respect them. But they're on the wrong side, my friend. And like John the Baptist called Herod to repentance, these men need to change. Amen. And many of the members, like blind guides, are following men like these to hell. To hell, my friend. Great controversy, page 556 five, says, watch this now. If there were no other evidence of the real character of spiritualism, it should be enough for the Christian to know that these men make no difference between righteousness and sin. They call evil good. Then they call good evil. They make no difference between what? Righteousness and what? Sin. How can we support such churches? God has one church, the Seventh Day Adventist denomination. But how can we support? with our presence and God's tithe, God's offerings, those local churches who are calling evil good and good evil. You are supporting the devil. What did these apostate priests do in Bible times? Huh? Which will happen again? They put no what? No difference between what? The holy and the sinful, profane, no difference between what? The unclean and the clean. So that means they're called what? Evil, good. And called what? They're called good, uh, evil, and friends. Uh, go back to verse 26. Uh, what did they do next? What did they hide their eyes from next? What did they hide their eyes from next, my friends? Uh, the Bible says what? They hid their eyes from God's Sabbath. Do you see that, my friend? This tells me that those who are voting yes for women's ordination, they're calling evil good and good 
evil. And the next step is what? They will turn their eyes from God's Sabbath. So those who vote yes to ordain a woman as an elder, a pastor in the church, Bible says, my friends, you will renounce the Sabbath. So now couple this with great controversy, page 608. And the central a part of the Seventh Day Adventist message is uh, one day very soon, uh, the third angel, as it says, uh, the mark of the beast will be enforced. Who will take that step? Those who call evil, good. And those who call good, evil. And friends, listen now. It doesn't stop there. Those who call evil good and good evil will turn around now and persecute God's people. Those who call evil good and good evil will turn around and call wicked men and women good. And those who are standing for God evil, that's happening right now, my friend. Isaiah chapter 5. So those who vote yes, those who vote yes on woman's ordination will persecute God in the person of his saints. Those who vote yes to ordain a woman as a pastor, to install a woman as an elder, will persecute true Seventh-day Adventist. Isaiah chapter 5. I give you a Bible for that. Matthew 15, verse 9, they were teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. And verse number 14, Jesus says, those who do this, leave them alone. Those who do this, leave them alone. Why? They be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall, we are my friends, into the ditch and the principle, the push to ordain, install a woman as a pastor, a woman as an elder, that is a tradition of men and not a tradition of God. And guess what? Those who were preaching the traditions of men, they rose above God's word. And those who listened and accepted the traditions of men and rejected the traditions, follow me, the traditions of God. When Pilate said to all these Jewish people, whom will you have me deliver unto you? Barabbas the robber or Jesus Christ the king? Who did they choose? Who did they choose? I wonder why. Because leading up to that great crisis, they were listening, accepting the commandments of men and not the commandments of God. And then they turned around. They called evil good, good evil. And then they condemned Jesus and accepted Barabbas. Last week we spoke about the issue of a woman's ordination. Installing a woman as an elder in the church, as a pastor in the church. That issue is not something we could just say, well, I hear that. It's not an issue to which we can be indifferent. It's not an issue in which we can find ourselves on the wrong side of the issue for to be indifferent and to be found on the wrong side of the issue might cause you your salvation. It is not an issue in which, friends, we can find a neutral ground. This issue of woman's ordination, it's an end time issue. I want to prove that to you, part two. Look at Isaiah chapter three with me. Look at verse number 12. Are we there? And for those of you who weren't here, you need to go and get that CD that has been provided and prepared for you today and get the sermon notes and accompany the reading of the sermon notes, the studying of those scriptures, uh, historical facts, uh, uh, present uh, events, and also statements from the spirit of prophecy. Listen to that CD. And friends, I'm asking you, stop being neutral on this issue and find yourselves on the right side of the issue. Because what we're going to see here, my friends, those uh, 
who vote yes on women's ordination. Those who say yes, a woman should be installed as a local elder, installed as a local pastor. Those who vote yes on a woman's ordination will also vote yes to persecute God's people. Amen. It's either I'm guessing at this or the Bible tells us so. Notice Isaiah chapter 3 with me. Look at verse number 12. Are we there, my friends? The Bible says, as for my people, children are their oppressors, and women what? Women rule over them. O oh, my people, they which lead thee, cause thee to err, and, 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 and destroy the way of thy paths. What could this scripture mean? One application, one meaning of this scripture is simply this, my friends. The Bible tells us all throughout scripture, from Genesis to Revelation, that in the home, it is the man that should be the spiritual ruler. In the church, it is a man that should be the spiritual ruler and the spiritual caretaker of the church. But here we find in Isaiah chapter 3, verse 12, the Bible says, women are the ones now ruling. Ruling where? The only areas uh, could be the home and in the church. And when you take a look at Isaiah chapter 3, the heading of Isaiah chapter 3 is, one, the day of the Lord is coming. Two, the calamities coming upon Judah, God's professed people. Three, it says, uh, the condition of God's people. Woman ruling over them. So this was one of the primary identifying signs that judgment was going to be poured out upon God's professed people. And since this issue of woman's ordination, installing a woman as an elder, installing a woman as a pastor in the various local churches, it shows then, my friends, that human probation is about to close on a global level. And the question is, if your probation was to close right now, how would you stand? How would you stand, my friends? This thing says, uh, watch this. What is one of the abominations that is present in the Seventh-day Adventist denomination? Answer, the ordaining of whom? The ordaining of women to the office of an elder, a pastor, a leader of a local conference, and a leader of a union of local conference churches. Last week we saw that there was an article that came out in Adventist News Network, which shows us that there are 13 divisions of the Seventh-day Adventist Church worldwide. Under each division, you may find thousands, hundreds, thousands of local churches. Florida, Orlando, where we are right now, safe to serve, we are on the North American division. That takes in America and Canada, hundreds, even thousands of local churches. Out of 13 divisions, all of those are divisions which have already spoken on the issue of women's ordination, again, installing a woman as a local elder in the church, a woman as a local pastor in the church, the majority, except for one division, the majority have already said, we will authorize a woman to be installed as a local elder, to be installed as a local pastor of the various churches. All of those who have already spoken, only one division, which is in Africa, only one division, which has said no, because it is not biblical. Oh, friends, you watch this. How do other denominations view the issue of women's ordination. If you take a look around you, as a matter of fact, most of us who are here in Orlando, Florida, if you just go up the street, there are about three Sunday churches, Sunday goers, those churches where there is a woman pastor. And these, in the, and women elders, and these people are clueless who sit in the pews that what they are supporting, it's unbiblical. 
And the sad reality is that the Seventh Day Adventist denomination, God's remnant church in these last days, are modeling, they are borrowing, they are imitating the practice of the Sunday churches. The, oh friends, the daughters of Babylon. Sad sight. And the majority of the churches in Babylon, they are now installing women as elders, women as pastors. And the Seventh-day Adventist church is doing likewise. What's going on among us? Since the majority of the Seventh-day Adventist leaders have begun to view the issue of women's ordination in the same what? Read those, come on. In the same what, friends? In the same light, in the same light as do the majority of the churches in Babylon, how would the sincere non Seventh day Adventists view our denomination? When we profess, my friends, to be the church in these last days uh, that live uh, by every word of God and in the Bible, woman being an elder or a pastor, it's unbiblical. So how then would the world view us? In Testimonies, Volume 9, page 23 says, The world is watching Seventh-day Adventists. It knows something of their profession of faith uh, and high standard. And when the world sees those who do not live up to their profession, the world points at them with scorn. And friends, think about this. When we are not borrowing, oh friends, listen, we are viewing the same issue and we are in agreement with the world on this issue of women's ordination. What is coming, pastor? Friends, let me tell you what's coming. Write this statement down in Great Controversy. Page 608 says, As a storm approaches, a large class who have once professed faith in the third angel's message, but have not been sanctified through obedience to God's truth, will abandon their position and join the rank of the opposition by conforming to the world and partaking of its spirit they have come to view matters in nearly the same light. And when the test, when the test, when the mark of the beast is in force, they are prepared to choose the easy popular side. So those who vote yes on women's ordination when the mark of the beast is in force, great controversy, page 608 says they will join with the world. And uphold Sunday, renounce God's Sabbath, they will receive the mark of the beast. What is one of the biblical requirements that a man must meet before he can be ordained and installed in the office of a bishop? Go to 1 Timothy with me. 1 Timothy chapter 3. Where are we going to? 1 Timothy chapter 3. The Bible says, my friends, in verse 4 and verse 5, the Bible says, 1 Timothy 3, verse 5, are we there? Verse 4, the Bible says, 1, that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? So in order for a man to take care of God's church, to be the spiritual caretaker in the church, to be the bishop, verse 1, verse 1, to be the bishop in the church, to be the elder in the church, he must be the spiritual ruler where first? In the home. So my friends, it is the spiritual ruler of the home, which biblically says should be the man. And once we have the biblical ruler in the home, the man, then he is the one. That should be the spiritual ruler where? In the church, as an elder, as a pastor, you don't find anything about a woman there, my friend. Is that clear? Amen. Beloved, is that clear? Amen. This thing says, uh, the order, the order that God placed inside the home is the order that he expects 
to remain in the church because the church is an extension of the home. But say some people, some people say, well, Pastor, my husband is not spiritual, so now I must take the lead. That's devilish. Some women say, but in my local church, the men aren't as spiritual as the women are. Who made you the judge? That's devilish. And even if in your home where you sleep, woman, and wives, and you have a husband who is not spiritual, that does not mean that you take on the leadership role in the home. If you profess to be more spiritual than your husband, then the biblical thing to do is to encourage your husband to be spiritual and to stand in his position. For to do otherwise, to try to rise above your husband, you are putting yourself into a position that God did not wire you to fill, and then you will leave your position vacant and empty. And so in the church, if you profess that the women are more spiritual, if they really are, then they must encourage the men to be spiritual in the church and to be the spiritual rulers. Would you say amen? amen. Well, I'll say it for you. Amen. amen. We must get in order with God's will. Once Seventh-day Adventist leaders begin to ordain women, to the offices designed for a man to fill, such as an elder or a pastor. What institution, along with its order, would they destroy? It is the marriage institution and its uh, order. What is the order of the marriage? Huh? Bible says, my friends, uh, the man must be the spiritual leader, ruler, weir in the home, and then he can be what now? The spiritual elder in the church. The spiritual pastor of the church. Go to Genesis chapter 3 with me. Where are we going to, my friends? Genesis chapter 3. Friends, bear in mind, to vote yes on a woman's ordination, you will receive the mark of the beast. You watch this as we go further. So my friend, what has been the order of the marriage institution after sin? In Genesis chapter 3, verse 16 tells us now, after sin, God said to Eve, verse 16, are we there? Bible says, thy desire, the last phrase of verse 16, thy desire shall be to thy husband, and what my friends? He shall what? He shall rule over thee. Go to Genesis chapter 1. Where are we going to, my friends? Genesis chapter 1. Look at verse 26 with me. The Bible says, And God said, Let us make men in our image after our likeness. Read the next phrase with me now, together. And let them have what? Have dominion over the fish of the sea. Pause right there, my friends. Question for you. To whom did God give dominion? Bible, is that what it said? To whom did God give dominion? Bible says, and let them have what? Dominion. But my question for you, my friends, my question is, before sin, who was made first? So if Adam was made first, who got dominion first? If since Adam was first formed, to whom did God give dominion? order and directions of how to deal with the home and things outside of the home. To whom? To Adam. What was Eve's title before sin? What was Eve's title and position before sin? She was a help me. So since she was a help me before sin, to whom then should she help? Who should she help? Adam. So who had the first dominion? Oh, beloved, that simple Bible, Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. Are we there, my friends? Bible says, uh, can you imagine if you went on a job and you were hired as an employee? Huh? You are the employee and you turn around trying to be the employer, the boss. Isn't that something, my friend? How long would you last on certain jobs? It wouldn't last long, right? Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. Are we there? 
The Bible says, and the Lord God formed the man and put him into where? The garden of Eden to dress it and to what? Keep it. Genesis 2 is further explaining Genesis 1, 26. Verse 16, and the Lord God commanded the man saying, who? The man saying, of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely what? Die. And the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be how? Alone. I will make him a what, my friends? A, a help me. So if since Eve was that help me, my friends, my question is, who had the first role, dominion, it was given to the man. But friends, bear in mind, Eve also received dominion before sin, but they had different roles. First Timothy chapter 2. Or together, my friends, I want to ask you a question. It's very simple. Did God make uh, a family in Eden? Did God make a family in Eden? Did he make two men? Did he make two women? But he, so now watch, he made a family, but there were different genders. Are, are you with me, my friend? Similarly, God made and gave Adam and Eve dominion, but they had different roles. First Timothy chapter 2. Are we there, my friend? So what is one of the dangers if a woman usurps authority over a man and is installed and even ordained in the office of an elder, a pastor, and a leader of a conference of churches. The Bible is going to tell us if the woman leaves her position and tries to fill an, a man's role both in the home and in the church, the Bible tells us, my friends, that the floodgates of apostasy Deception will open up in the home and in the church. 1 Timothy chapter 2. Are we there? Look at verse number 12. Bible says, but I suffer. I allow not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence together now. For Adam was what? First form, then what? Eve. And Adam was what? Not deceived, but what? The woman being deceived was in the transgression. Before sin, where was Eve placed? At Adam's side, they were on equal level. But Eve now listened to the devil through the serpent, and she wanted to rise above Adam. Are together? To be the ruler of both in the home and in the church, the family church, the home church. Or together, my friend. And by trying to rise above Adam, she sinned and fell where? By his side, where she was before? No, she fell where? Below. That's why now in Genesis chapter 3, verse 16, God now says, after sin, your desire shall be toward thy husband, and he shall what? Rule over thee. Let's skip past this. Hear what this says, uh, Eve, it's a note. Eve was not only trying to rule over Adam and to rise above Adam, but her desire was to also rise above God. Friends, you're not hearing this. Who inspired Eve in the first place to sin? Satan. Satan. Where was he before he came to this earth? He, Lucifer was in heaven. What was Lucifer's desire in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12 through verse 14? Lucifer wanted to what? Rise above God. So when Satan said to Eve, now your eyes shall be open and you shall be as God's old friend. Eve was affected. Eve was contaminated. Eve was infected by the same devilish sentiments of Lucifer. And by accepting those sentiments, like Lucifer, she what? Fell. What do you mean now the floodgates of deception will come to the church? When Eve was contaminated, when she fell, who did she turn to next? To cause his fall. She went to Adam. You put a woman as an elder or a pastor. Watch out. Watch out. 
Hear what this says. Keep in your mind that one of the issues that brought about the fall of mankind in the Garden of Eden was a woman listening and believing the devil and becoming unsatisfied with her original position as a what? As a helpmeet in the home and in the church. That woman, Eve, wanted to rule over the man and to lead out in the home and in the church. Eve also wanted to rise above God. Watch this now. Therefore, once we see a movement within the Seventh-day Adventist denomination, the church I love, God's professed people, to install and to ordain women as elders, as pastors, and as presidents of conferences of churches, we know what? We know for certainty that we're living in the last days. Why? Listen, the same issues, the same issues that surrounded the fall of mankind in the Garden of Eden are happening when? Are happening now. The final fall of mankind is about to take place. On what issue, what was one of the issues that caused the fall of Adam and Eve? Eve first, trying to rise above your position, Eve, to fill the position that the man must fill. Do you see it, my friend? And that was one of the issues that brought the fall in the first place. So when we see now that issue has come to full circle in the last days now, church is saying now we must ordain a woman to be an elder, a woman to be a pastor, to be the ruler in the home and in the church. Where are we now? We're in the last days. So no more can we look at women being pastors, women being, oh, that's just their culture. We're living in the last days, my friend. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Where are we going to, my friend? 1 Timothy chapter 4. Look at verse 1 with me. Are we there? The Bible says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, last days, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirit and doctrines of devils. What was one of the doctrine, doctrines of the devil? Based upon our conclusion so far, what did Satan say to Eve? <laughs> did we cover that this morning? No. One of the doctrines of the devil to Eve was what? Don't, 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 don't sit there being a helpmeet. You can rise above your husband. You can be as a God. You can be the ruler. Friends, what does a woman represent in prophecy? Church. Church. Hold on there now. Friends, you must get this. Since a woman represents a church in prophecy, Satan was also saying to Eve and to us in these last days, the church's standards can be placed above the word of God. You're not hearing me. Huh. Man-made traditions, man-made culture can be placed above the word of God. You can do that and still be saved. And the issue of ordaining a woman as an elder, a woman as a pastor, it's unbiblical. So when we say, let's go ahead and do it, what are we doing? We're putting man-made traditions above the word of God. And that's just one of the many issues confronting Seventh-day Adventism. And since that was one of the issues that brought the fall of mankind in the Garden of Eden, and now we're seeing it now confronting the church, where are we? In the last days. Look at Great Controversy, page 554. Satan begars men now. Let's pause right there, friend. Because what we're going to see is woman's ordination, it's spiritualism. And friends, may I say this, my friends? Listen, when we begin to hold to anything that's not biblical, we like Eve, we're trying to rise above God. 
When we have been confronted with God's truth and we reject God's truth and we keep on living, eating, drinking, listening to music, all these things, dressing however we want to dress, all these things, and we know that God's word condemned that way of living. What are we doing? And we keep doing what we are saying, like Eve, I can do whatever I want to do and still be saved. You shall not surely die, Eve, even if you partake of the forbidden fruit. So while we are looking at this on a church level, let's come to a personal application. GC 554 says, Satan beguiles men when? Now. As he beguiled Eve in Eden by flattery, by kindling a desire to obtain forbidden knowledge, by exciting ambition for self-exaltation, it was cherishing these evils that caused his fall. And through them, Satan aims to compass the ruin of men together now. Ye shall be as gods, he declares, knowing good and evil. Genesis 3 verse 5. What's the next word? Spiritualism teaches that man is the creature of, prog of progression. That it is his destiny from his birth to what? To progress even to eternity toward the Godhead. That's what the devil said to Eve. So to put a woman as an elder, as a pastor, that is spiritualism. Is that clear, my friends? Now watch. Since Eve received these principles of spiritualism, she was contaminated with the teachings of spiritualism, which are what? Lies. Therefore, 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 the push for woman's ordination is a doctrine of the devil, it is spiritualism. Who paused? Who was the first person who told Eve, you can rise above Adam? You can. So where did this thing about women being ordained, women being ordained as an elder, a pastor come from? It came from Satan, my friends. So 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 1 now says, Many shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of uh, devils. And friends, if people, since people are departing from the faith, where were they before? In the faith. So which church specifically is that text pointing to? Not the Baptist. Who? To the seventh day Adventist church. God's remnant denomination. Why? Because we profess to be the people of the Bible. Who walk by faith. But nowadays the majority of our leaders are walking by sight. Whatever the vote says, whatever the multitudes say, we will do it so we can fill our churches and fill our offering plates and we can sit over these networks and be popular in the church worldwide. Back to my screen. Since the majority of the Seventh-day Adventist leaders have begun and are still determined to install and to ordain women in the offices of an elder and a pastor, then what, my friends? Then spiritualism is prevalent within the denomination. Genesis chapter 2. Where are we going to, my friends? Genesis chapter 2. How can we discern the devil's deception on any guys. When the devil disguises himself, how can we discern the devil's disguise? How can we see it, my friend? The Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 2, in the Garden of Eden, one of the first deceptions of Satan was to add to God's word. Satan began his deception upon the human race by adding to God's word. And Satan ended his deception by subtracting from God's word. 
Let's go again. The deception that came to Eve. Satan inspired Eve to add to God's word and Satan deception upon Eve ended by Eve diminishing. Eve subtracting from God's word. What did Satan say to Eve? After Eve said, Jesus said, God said, in the day that we disobey, we shall surely die. The devil said what? You shall not surely die. Did Satan add to God's word? Yes. Huh? And as Eve received this addition to God's word, did she sin? And what is sin? The transgression or the breaking, the diminishing of God's law. Do you see it, my friends? Watch this. Watch this. Deuteronomy chapter 4. Where are we going to, my friend? Where are we going to, my friend? Deuteronomy chapter 4. My friends, what we're seeing here is that those who put a yes vote on a woman's ordination, they are adding to God's word. Amen. They're adding to God's word. Why do I say that? Because, friends, it is unbiblical to ordain a woman as an elder, as a pastor. You are adding to God's word. And the person who adds to God's word will end up doing what? Subtracting from God's word. And Revelation 22, verse 18, verse 19 say, my friend, the Bible says, if you add to God's word, God will add to you the seven last plagues. And if you subtract from God's word, he will rip your name out from the book of life and from the holy city, New Jerusalem. So those who are saying, it's okay, I don't care what the pastor says, I, as a woman, I will strive to be an elder. You're adding to God's word. I will strive to be a pastor. You are adding to God's word. And the Bible is going to tell us now, by and by, you will subtract from God's word. And friends, when you add to God's word, who do you think you are? God? We are spiritualists. Because that was the, the, the devil said to Eve, you can disobey God. Your eyes shall be open. You shall be as what? God's. The God is the, one, God is the one who writes the law. Do you see that? He gives the stipulations. Do you see it, my friends? And when we in ourselves, on a personal level, when we begin to do things, when we begin to live a certain way, when we begin to read certain things that we know God's word condemn, it shows that we are listening to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And if we do not change, we will be lost. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 2. Are we there, my friend? The Bible says together, You shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall you what? Diminish aught from it that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I want, which I command you. So once you begin to add to God's word, what's the next step? You will diminish from God's word. Friends, look at the screen here. The Great Controversy, page 289, puts it this way. The very beginning of the great apostasy was in seeking to supplement the authority of God by that of the church. Let's pause right there. Because this paragraph, it is filled with truth. It says the very beginning of the great apostasy was in seeking to supplement the authority of God by that of the church. Since there was a beginning of the great apostasy, there must be what? An ending of the great apostasy. How did the great apostasy begin? Huh? When the church began to supersede God's word by implementing upon its members man-made doctrines. You're not hearing me. So when now the Seventh-day Adventist denomination begin to use man-made traditions and culture, 
On this point of ordaining, installing a woman as an elder, a woman as a pastor, it shows then that we are living in a time when the church is superseding God's word. This tells us we are not living in the beginning of the great apostasy. We are living at the end of the apostasy. Last days, my friends. And friends, pause there. Which church, which denomination is known above every other denomination presently to supersede God's word with man-made tradition? Which church? Which church? Which church? Is the church that Pope Francis, the present Pope, belongs to. It's Roman Catholicism. And many of us as Seventh-day Adventists point and say, it's Rome that has used man-made traditions to supersede God's word and force those man-made traditions upon its members. Yet the Seventh-day Adventist leaders who should be God's remnant leaders are doing just like Pope. It shows then that we're drinking from the wine of Babylon. Don't walk away and say, well, pastor said, the seventh day of his church is Babylon. Didn't say that. But we are drinking from the same wine cup. Same wine cup. Back to my screen. The very beginning of the great apostasy. And friends, I'm going to show you some pictures here. Just in a few minutes, these same men would stand up and say, yes, Roman Catholicism, it is of the devil. Because they have used man-made traditions to supersede God's word. And one example is when Rome put Sunday, what day? Sunday, Sunday as God's Sabbath. What is that? Sunday worship is from paganism, heathenism. So now the Roman Catholic Church took a man-made heathen ceremony and said, now this is what God's professed people should do. And the same minister will stand up and say, I'm voting yes to ordain, to install a woman as an elder, a woman as a pastor. They are deceived. Deceived. Ah, oh, friends, don't get me started. The very beginning of the great apostasy. And let me come down to a personal level now. Many of us, we, we, we puff our chest. Oh, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. I'm not in Babylon. And yet, we live worse than those in the world. This thing says, the very beginning of the great apostasy was in seeking to supplement the authority of God by that of the church. Next word, together. Rome began by enjoining what God had not forbidden, and she ended by forbidding what he had explicitly enjoined. So what did, how did Rome start out in apostasy? She began to add to God's word. How did she end? By stripping from the word of God what he says man must do. What steps has Seventh-day Adventist leaders begun to take, my friends? There are no adding. Where will they end up? They will subtract from God's word. Look at this, friends. This is the news article. Adventist News Network, the same article. Hear what this says from one of the 13 divisions. It says, the South Pacific Division based in Warunga, New South Wales, Australia, said it does not see any scriptural principle that would be an impediment to women being what? Ordained. So since we don't see a scripture they're saying that says a, a woman should not be ordained, they're saying we're voting yes for woman ordination. And these same men will give Bible studies and preach evangelistic meetings and say, we must study God's word line upon line. It's deception, my friends. Look at the screen here. You have these ministers now. 
Pastor David Asherick. He says, I, listen, David Asherick said, I believe it was on uh, a website. He said clearly, he said, I don't see anywhere in the Bible where God's word say a woman should not be an elder or a pastor. Since I don't see where the Bible says a woman should not be an elder, well, I'm voting yes. David Asherick. Now, Pastor Carlton Bird, same, same sentiments. Dwight Nelson, same sentiments. Pastor Ricardo Graham, the Pacific Union president, same sentiments. And friends, I'm telling you, these are prominent men in God's church. Amen. But they have taken the wrong stand. And my prayer is, is that they will turn before it is too late. Amen. Because those who add to God's word, they will end up by doing what? Subtracting from God's word. And those who view matters in nearly the same light as the world will receive the mark of the beast. Go back to Great Controversy, page 608. These men and many others, many others, and don't think I'm picking on these or condemning these men. No, I respect them. But they're on the wrong side, my friend. And like John the Baptist called Herod to repentance, these men need to change. Amen. And many of the members, like blind guides, are following men like these to hell. To hell, my friend, because we don't read for ourselves. How many of us have ever read the Conflict of the Ages series from Patriots and Prophets to Great Controversy? How many of us have gone through these books? How many of us have educated ourselves by reading those nine volumes of testimony for the churches? How much time do we spend studying God's word in self-examination? If the blind follow the blind, both shall fall in the ditch. Genesis chapter 3. Where are we going to, my friend? Genesis chapter 3. How can we discern clearly and identify the real character of spiritualism? Not only, my friends, did Satan begin by adding to God's word, and he ended his deception by subtracting from God's word, but Satan's first deception was also to call evil good and the devil ended his deception by calling good evil God said to Adam and Eve that tree over there that fruit on that tree it is not good for food did God say that fruit was evil yes but what did Satan say to Eve the fruit is good for food the first deception was, my friends, uh, Satan began by telling Adam and Eve, even Eve primarily, that what God said was evil, it's good. And God, who had always been loving to Adam and Eve, uh, Satan now said, uh, God who is good, he's evil. Why? Because he is restricting knowledge from you. Do you see, my friends? Do you see that? The devil began by calling what God called evil, good. And he ended his deception by calling what God called good, evil. Yes. So my friends, this issue of woman's ordination, is it biblical? Is it biblical, my friends? That means it's evil. So when church leaders now begin to say it is okay to ordain a woman as an elder, a woman as a pastor, what are they doing? They're calling evil good. And how will they end up? By calling good. Oh, friends, watch this. Let's skip past that. Great controversy. Page 556 five, says, watch this now. If there were no other evidence of the real character of spiritualism, it should be enough for the Christian to know that these men make no difference between righteousness and sin. They call evil good. 
Then they call good or evil. They make no difference between what? Righteousness and what? Sin. How can we support such churches? God has one church, the Seventh Day Adventist denomination. But how can we support with our presence and God's tithe, God's offerings, those local churches who are calling evil good and good evil? You are supporting the devil. Amen. Hear what this says. It goes on together. Come on. Satan says what? One more time. Satan says to the world, no matter how wicked you are, no matter whether you believe or disbelieve God and the Bible, live as you please. Heaven is your hope. That is spiritualism, my friend. That's what the devil is saying to many today. It doesn't matter how you want to live. It doesn't matter how you want to dress. You want to wear a wedding band? Go ahead. You want to wear a wedding ring, earrings, necklaces? Go ahead. That's our culture anyway. Where you from? Jamaica? You like gospel reggae? Go ahead. They're calling my, my gospel reggae is of the devil. Amen. And any mixture, rap, R&B, uh, 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 country and western friends you name it you name it rock all of it it's of the devil Amen. isn't it sad that we have church services with that type of music hmm. that means those ministers what are they doing they're calling evil good and the next step is what my friends they will call good Watch this. Go to Isaiah with me. Hold on, hold on. Go to Ezekiel 22. Where are we going to, my friend? Ezekiel 22. And save to serve church members. With tears in my voice, in my heart, I'm asking you one question. Could you please examine yourself? Is there anything that you know is evil but you're not calling good? And how do we call it good? We know it is sinful, but we keep doing it. And we don't cry out to God saying, dear God, deliver me from this bondage of sin. It means that, my friends, you're calling evil good. And the next step, you will call good evil. It's just like some people in their homes. You have a son or daughter, and he loves to do what he or she wants to do. And that, that, that pyramid, that compromises with him or her he begin now to call that parent oh a lovely parent but the other parent the other parent who stands for the right with love and justice in the home that child you don't love me daddy or you don't love me mommy in essence what's going on they're saying, you don't love me because you don't allow me to do what I want to do. But the parent who compromises with them in sin, oh, they call them good. But the one who stands for Christ and his truth in love and firmness, they call evil. Let's examine ourselves, safe to serve. We are not at the beginning of the great apostasy. We are at the ending. Probation is closing. Ezekiel 22. Are we there, my friends? Are we there? Bible says, we came to church, amen? amen. We came to examine ourselves, amen. amen? We came to search our hearts, amen? 2 Corinthians 13 verse 5 says, examine yourselves. To see if you are in the faith. No, you're not. That if you are not in Christ, you are reprobates. Ezekiel 22, are we there? Verse 26, the Bible says, friends, watch this. Bible says, her priests have violated my law and have profaned my holy things. And have put no what? Difference between the holy and the profane, neither have they showed difference between what? The clean and the unclean together now. 
and I've hid their eyes from my Sabbaths, and I am profaned among them. What did these apostate priests do in Bible times? Huh? Which will happen again? They put no what? No difference between what? The holy and the sinful, profane. No difference between what? The unclean and the clean. So that means they're called what? Evil, good. And called what? They're called good, uh, evil, and friends. Uh, go back to verse 26. Uh, what did they do next? What did they hide their eyes from next? What did they hide their eyes from next, my friends? Uh, the Bible says what? They hid their eyes from God's Sabbath. Do you see that, my friend? This tells me that those who are voting yes for women's ordination, they're calling evil good. And good, evil. And the next step is what? They will turn their eyes from God's Sabbath. So those who vote yes to ordain a woman as an elder, a pastor in the church, Bible says, my friends, you will renounce the Sabbath. So now couple this with great controversy, page 608. Last week we saw, my friends, um, what will be the primary danger when the Seventh-day Adventist denomination, God's worldwide body, authorizes the ordination of women as elders and pastors? Answer, since that policy would destroy the institution and order that God placed in the world, in the home, then those same leaders would take the next step and what? Renounce God's Sabbath and urge their members to honor what? Sunday worship. Why? Because the marriage institution and the Sabbath institution are twins. Isaiah chapter 5. Where are we going to, my friend? So, friends, how can I be quiet on this issue? How, my friends? How? And the central a part of the Seventh Day Adventist message is uh, one day very soon, uh, the third angel, as it says, uh, the mark of the beast will be enforced. Who will take that step? Those who call evil, good. And those who call good, evil. And friends, listen now, it doesn't stop there. Those who call evil good, and good evil will turn around now and persecute God's people. Those who call evil good and good evil will turn around and call wicked men and women good. And those who are standing for God evil, that's happening right now, my friend. Isaiah chapter 5. So those who vote yes, those who vote yes on women's ordination will persecute God in the person of his saints. Those who vote yes to ordain a woman as a pastor, to install a woman as an elder, will persecute true Seventh-day Adventist. Isaiah chapter 5. I give you a Bible for that. Verse 20, are we there? Bible says, Woe unto them that call evil good, and good evil, that put darkness for light, and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet, and sweet for bitter. Look at verse 23 now. Which do what? Which justify. They commend the wicked for money, and position and condemn and take away the righteousness of the righteous from him. That's clear, my friends. Go to Matthew chapter 15 with me. Where are we going to, my friends? Matthew chapter 15. In the days of Jesus Christ, what, what were those Jewish leaders teaching in the synagogues? The Bible says uh, they were teaching for doctrines, the commandments of men. Matthew 15, verse 9, they were teaching for doctrines, the commandments of men. And verse number 14, Jesus says, those who do this, leave them alone. 
Those who do this, leave them alone. Why? They be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall away, my friends, into the ditch. And the principle, the push to ordain, install a woman as a pastor, a woman as an elder, that is a tradition of men and not a tradition of God. And guess what? Those who were preaching the traditions of men, they rose above God's word. And those who listened and accepted the traditions of men and rejected the traditions, follow me, the traditions of God. When Pilate said to all these Jewish people, whom will you have me deliver unto you? Barabbas the robber or Jesus Christ the king, who did they choose? Who did they choose? I wonder why. Because leading up to that great crisis, they were listening, accepting the commandments of men and not the commandments of God. And then they turned around. They called evil good, good evil. And then they condemned Jesus and accepted Barabbas. They call Barabbas good. They call robbery Barabbas the robber. They call robbery sin good. Give us Barabbas and call Jesus an evil man. What must I do with him? Crucify him, they said. And guess who told them to say that? The Jewish leaders. Matthew 26. Where are we going to, my friend? Matthew 26. Notice here, my friends, this is where we are. This is where we are, my friends. We are presently in the anti-typical judgment hall of Pilate. And Christ is asking you and me one question today. Whom do you want to be released? Which one do you want to be released? Do you want Satan to bear the burdens of your sin? Or do you want to keep crucifying me? Oh, my friends, did that ring in your ears properly? One question. Which one of these men do you want to be released? Friends, this is no more about Barabbas. It's about the devil now. Who do you want to be released? Who do you want to be set freed? Do you want Satan to bear your sins and to be lost? With those sins, pay for those sins, be destroyed for those sins, and do you want Christ to be released? Or do you want Jesus to keep being crucified, going through agony because you are calling evil good? Which one, my friend? Which one do you want to be released? Which one? Hebrews chapter 1. We close. Where are we going to, my friends? Hebrews chapter 1. We are in the time of judgment, my friend. And Christ is about to come to each one of our names. And the question is, when Christ calls my name in the investigative judgment, when Christ calls your name in the investigative judgment, will he find you calling evil good? Or will he find you calling good evil? Or will he find you saying, Jesus, give me more love for righteousness. Give me perfect hatred for sin. How will he find you, my friend? Oh, friends, how will he find you? It's self-examination time. How will he find you? If Christ was to walk through your home right now, if he was to come in your bedroom right now, if he was to walk into your living room on your library, will you play music? If he was to scroll down on your computer, your iPod, your iPod, what would, what would he find there? Would he find you calling evil, good, or calling sin by its right name? What would he find in your life, my friend? And today we have an opportunity to say, Lord, give me strength to hate sin. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 9. Are we there, my friends? Together what it says, the first phrase. Thou hast what? Thou hast loved righteousness 
and what? Hates iniquity. What does God hate, my friends? He hates sin. In what condition must we be brought in? In a condition to hate sin. But friends, can we hate sin in our own strength? So who has promised to give us a hatred for sin? Jesus says, I will put enmity in your heart. I will put enmity in your heart. So today, will you pray? Dear God, give me enmity in my heart. Give me hatred for sin. Will this be your prayer? Give me more love for righteousness because you have promised to put enmity in my heart for sin. Friends, the Bible says uh, the carnal mind is not what? Oh, beloved, have you forgotten it? Romans 8, 7, for the carnal mind is enmity against God. It is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. We are born carnal. We love sin. So Jesus Christ came now in the form of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in whom? In us. Can we come to the point in which we love righteousness? But now Romans 8 says we must walk after the spirit and not walk after the flesh. What does it mean to walk after the flesh? We are still desiring fornication. We are still desiring adultery. We are still desiring the, the sinful foods, the music, the lust of this world. We are walking after the flesh. We are still murmuring, still complaining against God. We are living in the flesh. Today, friends, Christ want to give us a new mind. Not a carnal mind, but he want to give us a spiritual mind. Let this mind be in you. Which was also in Christ Jesus. That word let means allow. Allow his mind to come in. Because he won't force us. So today, my friends, he's what? Knocking. And the question is, will you allow his mind to come in? How, does, how do we get his mind in? How? His what? His word. Will you allow his word to come into your mind? Huh, friend? Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Today, my friend, the Savior is knocking. Will you allow his word to come into your heart? That you will then begin to love righteousness and to hate iniquity? Will you allow Christ to come into your heart right now? Because, friends, he came and he gave all that you might be saved. He's now in the most holy place, giving all that you might be saved. And today, will you allow Jesus, his word, to come into your heart? Will you say, into my heart, into my heart, come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Come in, I pray. Come in to stay. Come in to my heart, Lord Jesus. I wonder if there's one today. Say, Lord, I want Bible studies. I want to be converted. Why not raise your hand? Is there one? 